Our next speaker up is uh, Yolan, and he actually told me not to say his last name because I would fuck it up. So, but he's going to talk about some pretty cool uh, future crypto stuff. So, um, give him a round of applause. Hey, hello everybody. Uh, so yeah, I'm Yolan Romaye. I'm super happy to be here today uh, to be uh, talking about a dead man's full yet responsible disclosure system, which is basically how to do cool shit with when you're able to encrypt towards the future. And uh, so I'm Yolan, so I'm from Switzerland, which is not the same as Sweden. So we got chocolate and cheese fondue and they got IKEA and even more snow than we do. Uh, I'm an applied cryptographer at Protocol Labs uh, on the distributed randomness team. But don't worry too much. It won't be about math and crypto, uh, as in cryptography, too much today. Um, some of it, not too much. And uh, yeah, let's get going. So I'll first do some intro uh, to explain you what you need to know to really understand what's going on later on. Uh, then I'll be talking about full disclosure versus responsible disclosure. Um, which is, you know, quite an interesting topic in InfoSec. Um, next, we'll see what is time lock encryption, uh, what it means. It basically means we can encrypt something towards the future, but we'll see what it actually means and what it enables you to do with uh, when you have it. Uh, and then we'll see how to use it. Uh, I have a small demo. Uh, and I'm pretty happy I'll be releasing uh, three different tools today, so that's pretty nice. Um, and then we'll talk about what can go wrong when we're talking about the future. So without further ado, let me start with the preliminaries with a digression. <laughs> I like these. Uh, I, I'm not going to do too many of these, but you know. So do you know what randomness is? According to the dictionary, randomness is simply the quality of being random. Great. Um, not super useful though. I prefer to see randomness as being the quality of being unpredictable or lacking any pattern, you know? And uh, that's a more useful thing to have when we do cryptography and computer sciences in general. And so everybody usually has some kind of intuition of what does random mean and what is random or what isn't. Like if I were to show you a binary string of 32 uh, characters, which was only ones, and I told you this binary string was picked at random, I'm not sure you'd be super convinced, right? Because it doesn't look random. Even though all binary strings have exactly the same probability of being drawn at random, and it could actually happen. Uh, I tried a few days ago on my computer, it took 15 minutes until it was drawn at random when drawing random numbers constantly. So it, it can happen to have a 32 uh, character all ones string when you draw stuff at random. But anyway, so randomness is usually hard. That's something you will hear cryptographers say quite often. Um, because actually a lot of the cryptographic schemes we are using nowadays to secure the web, such as uh, uh, ECDSA or EDDSA and a lot of signature schemes actually, but also the Diffie-Hellman uh, key agreements and so on are vulnerable when you have a bias in the randomness that you're using. And that bias can be very tiny. A one-bit bias in a signature scheme can allow you a full private key extraction, which is basically the worst thing that could happen to any crypto system. And um, so randomness is hard in general. And to make it even harder, when we're talking about computers, we're not actually using true randomness because there is such a thing as true random generators pulling you know, data from actually chaotic events, uh, such as, I don't know, like bubbles uh, in the water or 
um, atmospheric stuff and so on. But it's not what we're usually using in a computer. What we use usually is a pseudo-random generator, which is pulling some entropy from whatever you've typed on your keyboard from the jitter of the network. But that's not necessarily super random and could be somehow somewhat predictable. Um, and one important thing about randomness, in my opinion, is to recall that there are different kinds of randomness. And so to understand what distributed randomness means, because I told you I was on the distributed randomness team, right? So you must have figured my time lock encryption scheme somehow has something to do with that. Um, I need to explain you what are the different kind of randomness. And uh, the first two flavors of randomness we see the most often are actually public and secret randomness. Public randomness is, you know, whenever you, I don't know, play the lottery and you see people drawing numbers at random on the TV, uh, they are drawing a random number that is meant to be public. And that, uh, really just what it means to draw public randomness. It's a random number that is meant to be public. Secret randomness on the other hand is something that is meant to stay secret. So for example when you generate a PGP key uh, you're using a secret uh, randomness to create your key. Uh, most of the time when you connect to a website you'll be connecting with TLS and actually TLS is creating ephemeral secret keys and generating non sees number meant to be used only once, and the uh, IVs, initialization vectors, and so on. And all of these are secrets, and they are meant to stay secret, but they are also often random. And so whenever you have a random nonce, uh, it's meant to stay secret, and that's a secret uh, randomness, basically. So public randomness is nice. You know, you can draw a random number. Uh, and show it to everybody, sure. But if I were to run a lottery now today, and I, were, I was selling you tickets, and then my pal uh, Patrick was in the room, were to win the lottery when I draw the random number at random, I think you would be somewhat skeptical, right? You'd be like, oh, you cheated. And so there is a really nice notion of verifiable randomness that basically means you're able to verify the randomness was drawn properly and is properly random. And that's really useful, for example, if you want to be off the hook. So it's actually possible my uh, friend Patrick won the lottery today, drawn at random, you know, because there are not too many people in the room. And if I use verifiable randomness, you could verify I was not cheating, actually, and I'd be off the hook. So. Verifiable randomness is a very useful thing to, to have in general when we're dealing with public randomness. Um, next, we have the notion of distributed randomness. Um, it's a difficult thing to achieve consensus when you have a large system, right? And there are different ways of achieving consensus. But it's even more difficult if you want to draw a random number and achieve a consensus among different nodes on a given random numbers without any nodes being able to predict it or bias it. And uh, randomness, uh, distributed randomness has a few different kind of solutions and uh, actually um, my team is behind one of them which is called DRAND. And uh, DRAND is meant to be a public randomness service that anybody could use just like you use NTP servers to sync the time on your computers or just like you use free public uh, DNS servers to resolve domain names. Uh, so we thought the internet really needed a public verifiable distributed randomness service and that's what we tried to create and to launch. So DRAN is basically just uh, software. It's open source. Uh, you can check it out. And it's using pretty cool threshold cryptography based on pairings, uh, specifically the BLS signature scheme to generate randomness in a way that's very fiable. And DRAN has actually been deployed in practice uh, by the League of Entropy, which is a team of 16 uh, different 
parties and organizations running 23 nodes. And the cool thing about Diran is it's using threshold cryptography. So you don't need to trust any of these parties as long as you trust that there is never a threshold number of malicious node in the network. And so here you can see there is Cloudflare, Protocol Lab, but also universities, um, security companies, Kudolsky Security, um, and yeah, a lot of different parties that are not you know, likely to collude. And so the threshold being currently 13, it means you can have a fairly good trust in the network not to collude and do nasty things. Um, Diron has been running for two years um, by the League of Entropy and it's really solid and uh, yeah, so far so good. So now that we know what distributed randomness is and that there is a service out there providing it for anybody to use, we can dig into <laughs> the title of my talk, I guess. So you all know about um, full disclosure and disclosure, I guess, but I'm still going to walk through the different kinds of disclosures that are out there. So uh, disclosure, you know, is basically what you do when you find some vulnerability in a software or in a product or in a service and you want to disclose it either to the vendors, the creators, the coders or to the public whatsoever. And uh, according to OWASP, the uh, Open Web Application Security Project, there are actually three different types of uh, disclosures. But I think they're wrong, you know, there is a fourth one, the non-disclosure where you just find something cool and decide to, I don't know, use it for fun and profit or whatsoever. Um, sure, that's a way to do things. The other types of disclosure are the full disclosure where you find something cool and you're like, hey, listen, I found something cool. Here is a zero day, anybody can use it. And here is a proof of concept too because I'm nice. So you can really weaponize it directly. Um, that's a way of doing things. Please don't do it on Fridays. It's really mean for the security teams. No, truly. Um, then there is the private disclosure. Uh, nowadays we have a lot of bug bounty programs which, you know, give you a reward if you find a vulnerability in somebody's product. But often these bug bounty programs tell, uh, forbid you to, for, they're forbidding you to release your findings if you want the reward. Which leads to a lot of private disclosures. I. I'm not convinced because I'm a cryptographer, so I don't believe uh, security through obscurity is a good thing. Uh, and instead, what I would prefer to have is a responsible disclosure, for example, which is basically just when you do a private disclosure first and then you say, hey, listen, in 30, 60, 90, six months, I don't know, uh, 90 days, six months, I'll be releasing my findings for everybody to look, so you have some time to patch, but hey, I'm still going to release it, do a blog post, uh, I don't know, go to DEF CON to present it, uh, and so on. And so, coordinated disclosure are actually quite used in the industry. If you look around, you can see, for example, Google Project Zero, which is doing a lot of uh, vulnerability research and they're finding a lot of vulnerabilities and they're also always using a hard deadline policy uh, with their disclosures, which is basically that you have 90 days to patch your product and if you do, they will give you an extra 30 days, you know, to be able to prep your blog post or your communication whatsoever. But if you don't patch within 90 days, they will release it uh, publicly for anybody to, to be aware, to help people protect themselves, basically. And um, that's actually quite effective. According to their own metrics, there are only 3% of their disclosures that are not patched within 90 days. Uh, which is great. So it means most people, most vendors out there are actually using their time to patch effectively to patch their uh, software. 3% of them though are not. So I don't know what they do. Uh, maybe they're just ignoring the vulnerabilities whatsoever. But yeah, they don't patch. So let's recap. A coordinated disclosure or a responsible disclosure timeline basically looks like that. So let's say um, you're finding something on January 1st, you know. 
you take a few days, you write a report, you create a proof of concept whatsoever. Let's say mid-January you're disclosing it privately to the affected um, vendor. Um, then they come back to you early February because I don't know, the people responsible for it were on vacation or they were slow at reading their security at mailing list whatsoever. Uh, they come back to you and they're like, oh yeah, you're right, it's a vulnerability, so thank you, we will patch. And then you could talk to them and be like, hey, I would like to, I don't know, go to DEF CON and present it, so how about doing a responsible disclosure and so on. And you can agree on a given release date, you know, in the future, maybe, maybe uh, on May the 4th, you know. You could say, hey, I'm going to release everything on my blog on May the 4th and if they're, you know, Warn, they can patch and they have some time to patch. Which is nice. And then you can, on May the 4th, you can release it whatsoever. However, there is a small issue with that. I don't know if you're familiar with the notion of bus factor. But the bus factor of a project is basically the number of people that need to be crushed by a bus before the project is critically uh, impacted. And with a responsible disclosure, it's very likely you just disclosed it to the vendor and then you keep it to yourself until the agreed upon release date, right? So here, during that time to patch period, you're actually having a very low best factor, maybe even a best factor of one. And so it could be the case that some vendors in these three percent uh, which are not patching within the time to patch are actually more malicious than we thought. And instead of shooting the noob at DEF CON, they could try to, you know, actually shoot the noob. And that's a bit annoying because if you're careful or if you wanted to prove you found something cool, maybe you've published on Twitter a hash of your findings, right? So you publish the SHA-256 sum of your findings on Twitter and then at a later date you'll release the paste bin with the text and anybody can verify it's the same hash so anybody can check you were actually the one to have found the issue, um, I don't know, on January 1st. Which is a nice way to do things but which also mean you need to be alive on May the 4th to be able to release the, the report, right? And that brings us to the time to patch issue which means somehow we might want to have some kind of dead man switch so that if we're not there anymore our findings would still be released, right? And that's a very good use case for time lock encryption. So what is time lock encryption? Time lock encryption is very simple. It's basically being able to encrypt something today that cannot be decrypted until a later date, maybe Christmas or maybe tomorrow. And then you can just release it, the ciphertext, and anybody can try and decrypt it, it won't work. And tomorrow when they try again, it will decrypt and it works. Seems a bit like magic, right? Um, it's also sometimes called time lapse encryption or timed release encryption. Um, these are all the same thing. And it has pretty cool applications. Uh, you could use it uh, in auctions to do sealed bid auctions, for example. Or you can use it also, I don't know if you're running a blockchain, but you could use it to prevent MEV issues uh, where you have miners trying to grind the mining process to extract more value from the blocks than just the transaction fees. Uh, you could use it for a cool conditional transfer of wealth thing. Uh, which is basically you encrypt your, bit your Bitcoin private key for in, I don't know, in two years and if you die uh, within the next two years your children will be able to get your private key um, in two years. And if you're still alive you can just transfer your, bi your Bitcoins to a new um, address and nobody can extract them anymore. Um, 
you could also use it for, I don't know, electronic voting, for example, if you need to, re or more interestingly, also uh, somewhat related to electronic voting, you could use it to uh, protect documents that have a known embargo period, like legal documents that you must release six months after the deed or something like that. It could be very useful to do these kind of things. If you know, you're attending DEF CON, maybe you have other funny ideas, you could use it to do very uh, well-behaved ransomware, which instead of encrypting your files forever, would encrypt them for, you know, six months. If you're in a hurry and you want them today or tomorrow, please pay. Otherwise, you just need to wait six months. Fine, right? Um, I mean, I would love f more fair ransomware. It's almost, you know, honest if they do that. Um, also, there is a cool paper uh, that was released a few years back about using time lock encryption to prevent emulation uh, in antiviruses. You know, when an antivirus is trying to emulate your binary to see if it's doing something fishy, uh, well, you could use time lock encryption so that the antivirus cannot see what's going to happen when the payload gets decrypted because it's not the right time yet. Uh, these are all cool ideas. And actually, time lock encryption is a pretty old idea. It was first uh, proposed by Tim May in 1993 on the cypherpunk mailing list. So, for those of you who don't know Tim May, he's a pretty cool guy who actually was the father of the uh, crypto anarchist movement. So, yeah, cool guy. He actually introduced the idea along with a way of solving it, which was basically to give decryption keys to notaries which is basically just uh, trusting somebody with your decryption keys. Uh, not amazing. Three years later, in 1996, uh, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and David Wagner, so the, you might have heard of the two first uh, guys because they are behind the RSA crypto system, I guess. Uh, they proposed a proof of work based uh, system which was called time lock puzzles where the idea is basically that if you can force somebody to do a certain amount of work sequentially on their computer, you can make sure they are not able to decrypt it before the right time has come, right? And they also said in that paper there are only two ways of doing time lock encryption. Either using proof of work or using trusted third parties. And actually they implemented it in practice and Ron Rivers published a time lock capsule in 1999, which was meant to last for 35 years, uh, including the Moore law, so including the fact computers would get faster and faster. He was, you know, pretty sure it was solid and, uh, yeah. Well, naturally. Only 20 years later, in 2019, the puzzle that was supposed to take 35 years to solve was actually solved by two different teams. Uh, one of them was actually one guy running the thing for three and a half year on his um, Intel CPU. And even though it was supposed to take 35 years, it took only like a tenth of that. Uh, because the computers were not that fast, you know, not as fast as uh, Rivas thought they would be in uh, 2034. But just the squaring process uh, he was using to protect his puzzle uh, was not as slow to do, you know. Another team, which was uh, actually a collaboration of Ethereum Foundation, Supranational, and Protocol Labs, was able to do it in only two months using FPGAs with a very low latency circuits doing uh, squarings, which is, you know, way too fast. So it means using proof of work is not amazing. And then there is a whole list of people who also did research the time lock uh, ID, and they came up with other ways to do it, like using Bitcoin proof of work, um, using fancy cryptography based on obfuscation, using homomorphic stuff, and all of these are really nice ideas, but they are not practical at all. So it means there are, to date, no practical way of doing time lock encryption beside proof of work, and meh. I don't really like proof of work. I mean, it's burning the planet and it's not super nice. Also, if you get faster hardware, you could break it faster. Not really reliable. So, that's 
what we were able to actually solve. And so our goal here is to encrypt towards the future, right? So it would be really nice if we had a cryptographic reference clock ticking, I don't know, every 30 seconds, for example, and that you could say, okay, I'm going to encrypt towards the round number, um, I don't know, 10,000. And you know, round number 10,000 will be in two days, for example. And that idea of a cryptographic reference clock was actually already introduced in a paper in 2017. Um, and that's a pretty nice thing. But they never really created a practical reference clock. And that's where DRUN comes in. Because DRUN is basically releasing random values every 30 seconds. And it has been doing so for two years. And you can trust the... I mean, if you trust the, there is never a threshold amount of malicious nodes in the network, you can trust it will be releasing randomness on time for, you know, the foreseeable future. And so what we can do now is basically take the DRUN rounds and map them to a given specific future time. And we can rely on the BLS signatures of the DRUN beacons to do pretty cool things. And I told you earlier that BLS was a pairing-based signature scheme. And pairings are really nice because there is also the notion of identity-based encryption that is based on pairings. And with that, we can say we want to encrypt something towards a specific message. And whenever the signature for that message is released, we will be able to decrypt it. And so, that's the magic of pairings, basically. So if you want the math, here it is. So a pairing is basically a bilinear map from two groups, G1 and G2, onto a target group, GT. And I told you it's a bilinear. So it means that if you take the pairing of G1, the generator of the group G1, and a signature P, a signature P is basically the secret time the message when you're using uh, BLS, but on G2. If you take the pairing of G1, the generator, with the signature P, you can actually say it's, you know it's equal to the secret time the pairing of G1 and the message. And that's really nice because anybody can compute the pairing of G1 and the message. But anybody can also compute the pairing of the public key of the BLS scheme, which is PG. And the public key is basically the secret time the generator on G1. And oh, what happened? That's a bit annoying. It seems the screens are frozen actually. Um, can I have the AV guy checking? So, yeah, it seems it's completely not displaying the right thing. It's, it's not updating on the big screen. Yeah, the big screen is not updating anymore. So I don't control the big screen. It's you yeah, no, no, it's not. <laughs> if you look here, it's black and here it's blue. So. Yeah, but you have to switch on here. Uh, Screen is not. So I think it's a back end issue. You can leave it like that. No, but I don't know why it's not switching back to here. Who's controlling the big screen? No, you are. No, yeah. Yeah, see, the screen's locked. 
Can you reboot the screen? So wait, what it's what is it like? Okay, it seems to be back. So I'm not sure what you saw all the time. I mean, has it been f frozen for a long time? Okay, so you didn't see any of the white slides? Did you see that? Okay, yeah, so uh, what I was saying must probably have been very strange to you anyway. So that was the timeline, you know, when you want to encrypt towards the future. And that's a really nice thing where you can use JRUN to map to uh, specific rounds. And the nice thing is that we use pairings and here is the math. And you can check the math or you can trust me, um, it works. And this is even more math. Um, pairings are really cool. They allow you to do really cool shit. And uh, if you download the slides, there is even more details at the end of the slide deck. Anyway, there is one problem though, is that we need to be able to predict the message that is going to be signed in order to encrypt towards a specific message in the future. And so one thing was that DRUN was using chain randomness where every round uh, was actually linked to the previous round so it wouldn't work too well. Uh, but actually the security assumption behind it is that there is never a threshold of malicious node in the network. So we could just unchain it. We didn't need to have chain randomness. We can just sign the message which is the run number or the hash of the run number and that will work with the exactly same security assumption as we did with the previous version. And that has been just actually released on testnet uh, a few weeks back and it's coming to mainnet in mid-September. So there is another issue is that if you want to encrypt very large files, um, you can't really because the time lock uh, scheme we came up with is only able to encrypt small blocks, maybe a thousand bits top. So the easy way out is that you can encrypt with AES, which allows you to encrypt, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes, and you just encrypt the secret key you are using with AES. And that's exactly what PGP does uh, when you're using PGP to encrypt files. And so it's a really nice solution whenever you need to encrypt lots of data. And with that, we've actually created uh, two time locks libraries, one in Go, another one in GS, which allow you to try to encrypt stuff today if you want. Um, with the libraries, we also are providing a CLI tool if you want to, you know, just like you are using PGP, you are able to use TLE to do time lock encryption in your terminal today, uh, provided you go install on your machine. TLE is fairly easy to use. It's, a bi it's based on AGE, which is a fairly nice uh, common tool to do uh, modern uh, uh, public key encryption created by Filippo. Um, and uh, we figured it might be too difficult for people to use a command line tool for a demo, right? So we came up with a JavaScript library and a web demo. And so uh, we can actually try the web demo. Um, if I click the link. So anybody can try it. It works on the phone too. Um, Time Vault, that's the name of the web demo, is basically just a way to encrypt your, you know, text, whatever text you have to encrypt, or your vulnerability report if you prefer. And uh, you can just choose a time in the future. So um, let's say um, 5 p.m. Uh, like 05. Okay, and uh, you can try to encrypt something. Okay. 
So if I copy paste that in the decryption, it should know, it should fail because it's not yet uh, five past five. But if we wait just a few extra seconds, it should work, right? Because it will be five past five. And so now it's five past five according to my uh, screen. So if I try again. Demo effect. Ta-da! And uh, yeah. So we can see it works uh, in practice today by relying on DRAND to provide the randomness. Um, and, oula, too, too quick. And so if you need to use it in your project or if you have cool ideas of stuff you could do with timelock encryption, please go ahead and use our libraries. You can even uh, choose to use your own DRAND network if you don't trust the legal entropy. Uh, everything is fairly easy to use. And it's actually based on cryptography that has been researched since the early 2000s. So BLS, uh, it's 2001. And the identity-based encryption system we're using, it's 2003 and is providing proper security guarantees. Now there is just one remaining problem with time lock encryption. So we've seen there is a cool way to provide a dead man switch basically to encrypt your vulnerability reports and instead of posting the SHA-256 of your findings on Twitter, you could directly post the link to your paste bin with a cipher text. And uh, in 90 days anybody could decrypt that, uh, that cipher text, right? So Cool, but the problem is we're talking about the future, so there could be new attacks, right? Somebody could come up tomorrow with a new attack against BLS and that would break all the uh, ciphertext that would have been encrypted with time lock encryption. Um, so it could be annoying. Another big issue is that BLS and uh, the IBE uh, system we're using is actually relying on the discrete log logarithm assumption, which is known to be vulnerable to quantum computers. So if you want to encrypt something that is not meant to be decrypted until, I don't know, in 30 or 50 years, uh, it's maybe not a good idea. So don't use it to encrypt your confessions or whatsoever. You know, it could be decrypted earlier maybe if a quantum computer is ever built that's strong enough to break the schemes we're using. And also the fact that we're relying on the threshold systems means it's fairly uh, solid, you have a good liveness properties, you can expect the network to be up for a long time but who knows, maybe in 10 years, in 20 years, all of the League of Entropy members will be, you know, gone, who knows. So it might be possible your ciphertext could never be decrypted if you're encrypting something for, you know, in 20 years. And also, what about governance? So the problem with a network that is meant that is built with a lot of people is that suddenly maybe the legal entropy members could decide to stop the network. And then what happens with the cipher text? So there is two options. The league could say we are going to release all key material so anybody can decrypt everything now, uh, which is maybe not amazing. Or maybe the team members will, the league members will say we'll just destroy the key material, which means all of the ciphertext could never be decrypted unless a quantum computer is built, which could also be annoying. But these are really like governance questions, so I guess the main solution is to have two networks and people could choose either the network that is going to release all keys if it ever goes down or people could choose the network that is never going to release any keys if it ever goes down. And yeah, that would work nicely. Um, finally, um, this work is a team effort actually, so um, credits goes to the DRAN team including uh, Nicola Gai who had the initial ID and is also the creator of DRAN, uh, Patrick McClurg who was behind all the JavaScript magic, uh, Julia Armbrust who is behind the web demo design and also I want to thank a few people who had very uh, cool comments and who helped or who helped us with the project. So Justin Drake, Jason Dunnenfeld and also Arden Labs uh, for helping us along the way. Um, with that said, if you find 
time lock encryption is a pretty cool thing and you would like to help secure the network, the League of Entropy is looking for new members in new other geographies, especially in Asia. So if you're used to run a high availability service and you want to try to join the league, please ping me. That would be nice. Uh, also, the DRUN team within Protocol Lab is hiring, so you can also ping me if you're interested in joining. We are looking for Go uh, developers, backend developers, and also security professionals like application security and um, cloud security. And uh, thank you. If you want to see the code, it's on GitHub. Uh, we released it this morning, so it's there. Um, and also stay tuned if you want all the details about how it actually works under the hood. We are going to publish a preprint and ePrint uh, in the coming two months. And I'm probably going to be releasing also a blog post explaining how the whole thing works uh, next month. At the same time as we'll be launching on the, uh, on the main net. Because for now it's running on testnet which has only uh, six nodes, uh, a threshold of six instead of 13, so the security is not as high on testnet uh, as it is on mainnet. But you can already use it today, try it out on testnet, it works. And uh, yeah, with that, I think I might have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so the network is using threshold cryptography and distributed key generation, which means the actual key to decrypt uh, the ciphertext or to sign the, the beacons is never in memory on any computers. But if you are able to compromise a threshold amount of nodes, uh, you can get the actual secret key of the network and you would be able to decrypt all future um, ciphertext. Uh, that's one of the problem with time lock encryption. You can naturally recall a ciphertext once you've released it and you cannot do key rotation. So uh, it's a bit difficult. We do key rotation um, for each node. So it means if you compromise one node today on another one in, I don't know, next week on another one in three weeks and so on, um, at some point we will do a key refreshing which will change the shares of every members of the league and so um, if you didn't compromise enough nodes yet, you wouldn't be able to use what you've got uh, for anything. So, but yeah, the key itself, the actual secret key of the network is never properly rotated because it's a threshold network and we only do refreshing of each node's shares. Thanks. Yes? So the question is about the quantum resistance uh, of the of the of the whole thing. The problem with quantum resistance is uh, that you need a scheme that's not relying on uh, something that we know is broken by quantum computers, and BLS uh, is relying on something that we know is broken by quantum computers. So you would need to use another signature schemes to sign the different beacons that is not uh, relying on any assumptions that's already broken by quantum computers and currently there is no uh, properly um, threshold signature scheme that is quantum resistant so no luck for now. But it's something we're looking into uh, maybe at some point in the future if there is such a scheme to create a new network running on a quantum resistant scheme. Yeah. Um, Oh, I think we're at time. So if you want to talk to me, uh, I'll be in the corridors and you can also reach out on Twitter. Thanks.